Serious doctors of Reddit, what do you want your patients not to know? You know how it takes me like 5 minutes to take your pulse. I'm also watching your chest to count your breaths, but I don't want you to know it, or you'll become conscious of your breathing. Your surgeon is terrible, possibly. Look your anesthesiologist or nurse anesthetist in the eye, and ask them if they would be okay with this surgeon operating on their family. If they hesitate, proceed forward at your own risk. We call one guy the butcher of Baghdad. The reason I seem to remember all about you and keep up with the personal stuff you tell me is because I write good notes and reread them 5 seconds before I walk into your room. If you tried to talk to me at, say, the grocery store I wouldn't know you from Adam. As a gynecologist, I don't want you to know that the real reason the nurse is in the room helping me with the procedure is that she's there to cover my ass in case you try to accuse me of assault. You would never do that. Neither would 99. 99,999% of women. But even the accusation could be career ending, so it's worth paying somebody to stand there just to make it that much less likely. Sometimes I think my patients are whining brats who seem to always want a quick fix with no real effort on their part. I really don't want them to know that I think that of them, but I do all day long. MMM. This is a tough one. There's very little that I keep from my patients that has to do with their health. You probably know this, but chances are, though, many of your surgeries and general care are done by residents. Residents can be anywhere from year 1. Year 3 slash 4 slash 5 slash 6 slash 7. They could just be coming in for their shift, or they could be at the tail end of their 24 hour shift. I'm surgical, so a few things here. When you walk into the, or, we are professional and friendly. The minute you're knocked out, we go back to our old conversation that we had before you walked in. There's tons of drama, oh god, so much drama, between the nursing staff, between the anest and the surgeon, and in general. Most likely, if it's a long surgery, we lift up your sheet we placed on you, when you laid down on the table, and place a catheter in your bladder. If you woke up after surgery with a catheter, it means that most people in that room, and some more who walk in to grab some supplies, has seen your genitals. Once you're asleep, many of the procedures are also practiced on you by medical students. If you're going into an obgen procedure, chances are a medical student has examined you once you're asleep. We are human. As professional as we try to be, we make jokes, when we are not supposed to, we make mistakes, we get emotional. I really do try my best to deliver the best care, and try to be fully honest, but maybe it's, because I'm new to this. I've heard that my enthusiasm will wear off soon, but I'll do it, as long as I can. This is late and buried, but I'll throw in my two cents as a radiologist. If you're too fat to image, I have no sympathy for the quagmire of medical illness you probably have. Radiology is one of my most utilized services by any clinician. If you have a symptom, there may be a scan for it, but by god, we are yoked to the mercy of the laws of the physics that have been harnessed into these machines. So once, I get a frantic call from a FMG on call. FMG, I have this patient who has shortness of breath. I would like to rule out pulmonary embolus. He weighs 550 lbs. Me, no can do. Table limit for court is 450. FMG, can I get a scan from the zoo? Me, nope. In fact, we scan their animals for them. FMG, so what do I do? Me, shrug, treat him. Looks like he ate himself out of a diagnosis. The struggle is real. Obesity makes it physically impossible for you to be imaged. Either you can't fit in our machine or the laws of physics simply won't allow our various beams and energies to penetrate into the depths. In that particular case, the patient would have undergone a not risk-free course of anticoagulation which carries a serious risk of adverse bleeding. Just seeing case after case of things like this has made me truly hate the obese. The truly super super obese. They outright disgust me. Take a fucking walk once in a while. Edit. Gold. Wah. Bites Reddit gold. Thanks mister. All joking aside I see that many of you understand the limitation that super super obesity causes. If you think that sounds strange, why do I keep saying super super, then you may not realize that that is the actual official classification for that kind of obesity. BMI. 60. 
For those of you wondering where my sympathy is, I'll be honest. The reason I loathe people that big is because I'm overweight myself. Not super super obese mind you. I'm 6 feet 3 inches and weigh 260, but weight has been a struggle for me too. Where my hatred comes from is that people who are this obese are suffering from at its root, a psychological and psychiatric issue that becomes a huge physical crisis. I view that type of obesity as a very slow painful suicide. Eat, eat, and eat the void away some more. But it never fills. It just deepens and worsens the cycle. I know that road. I've been down it, and I turned back. I got healthier, I got wiser, and ultimately realized that I had to take control to make better choices. But the first right choice I had to make was deciding that I wanted to stay and live and thrive in this world. I found my reasons. Get busy living, or get busy dying. When I see people that big, it's clear they gave up. I almost gave up too, at one point. I don't like to be reminded of it, so it fills me with deep revulsion for them and myself. But also, that goes into the psychology of me treating them. If you don't give a shit about yourself, why should I? Why should we as a society? 99% of the time, I do a physical exam, listen to your heart and lungs, push on abdomen, look at the back of your throat, not because it's going to change anything I do, but because it allows me to build Medicare at a higher level. If you come in with knee pain and I listen to your heart, I'm just going through the motions. I really don't care what your heart sounds like. I work in an ER. Well since even vet techs are chiming in I guess I'll have my say. I perform ultrasound imaging. We are known in the medical community as diagnostic medical sonographers. Or ultrasound techs. We don't just scan babies, as most people seem to think. Heart. Check. Liver. Kidneys. Breasts testicles, spleen, pancreas, vasculature, you name it, check. What can't we tell you? The number one issue I have with patients is obesity. After that, hygiene. Your images suck. That's because you have too much damp fat for the beam to travel through. Chicken wing falling out of your fat roll? I'm gonna hurl as soon as I leave the room. That funky smell from your crotch. Fucking wash before your appointment. Everyone can smell you, not just me. I'm simply disgusted by the vast majority of you. There, I said it. In an opt out state, your nurse anesthetist may be so green, yet supervised by a surgeon, that they don't know the diff between a fiber optic bronchoscope and a carlonoscope. Seems ridiculous, but I've seen it with my own eyes. These are the people responsible for your life. Also I have nothing against seasoned granas, but the rookies are flat out killers. That I was late to see you and or can't spend as much time as I'd like talking with you about and managing your health. Because I probably have seen one or a few exhausting and unrewarding patients with pain and or psych issues that take a disproportionate amount of time and energy. All I want to do is help people who care about their health and will partner with me instead of treating me like a candy dispenser. I don't want you to know how little I care about you personally. No, I'm not made of stone. But if I let my feelings for you get personal I can't act objectively, and I won't be the best doctor you can have. There's also the fact that I'm tired of getting emotionally wrecked whenever I find out patient X didn't come for his HIV meds because he kicked the bucket last week. Not much really. I wish they wouldn't know every one in a million side effect of everything. It really makes vaccination and prescribing difficult if people place too much importance on rare events. We need perspective in these things or else we'd never even want to get out of bed in the morning for something that might happen. I'm happy patients are better informed, but it's a balance sometimes. If you slash your, so slash your family want to speak to me after the end of my shift I will pretend I'm not there. The nurses will call me, and I will not answer. I also have a private life and I also need to sleep slash eat slash shower. I stay there after the end of the shift to do the bureaucracy. If you are fat, you will get substandard care. I cannot perform a good ultrasound. I cannot place a venous line. I will most likely give you weaker oral medications than the eye that you need. I cannot examine you from all the fat. I know you, when you are my patient, I know every single detail about your disease. I might even know your whole family. But when I meet you on the street or you come after a couple of days again, I will have to reread my previous letter before I can remember anything about you. 
I cannot keep every single detail about 12 to 20 patients every single moment of time. If you are not nice, if you think that you can behave like an asshole you will get substandard care. I'm sorry, but a good relationship between us works two ways. If you are a junkie alcoholic I will assume you are lying about everything. You will also come second after all the really sick patients. If you were a junkie slash alcoholic who is recovering and trying to put your life in order, you will get 120% of care from me. You will get all the social and medical help I can offer. Young come before old. I'm sorry, but your 95Y slash O grandma won't get the same standard of care as a sick 20 year old. She is also not going to be the first to get the CT slash colonoscopy slash ultrasound or anything other. This will probably be buried by this point, but if you get a direct to consumer DNA test, such as 23andm, don't assume that your doctor will be able to interpret the results for you. Many doctors, especially older doctors and those that focus on family care, are not especially educated on all of the latest advancements in genetic testing and diagnosis. Always go for a second opinion. As a geneticist, I'm always a little scared to realize that I know more than the doctor I'm sitting beside. As a cancer patient I find this to be a really effing depressing read. I'm over 60, and much of what I've suspected about doctors seems to be upheld here. But once my life was on the line, I went with suspension of disbelief. Kind of like shooting craps in Vegas. I'm still alive, so I guess it worked. Have yet to check out of the game. Thanks to those who have ethics and talent. Half the drugs we prescribe for CNS conscience excluding Parkinson's, epilepsy, and schizophrenia cause more problems than they solve in most cases. Little hyperbole, but not near as much as I'd hope. Also, obesity makes treating someone insanely difficult most of the time. Have you tried to listen for a pericardial rub in someone with a solid 8 centimeters of fat between you and their impkitch? Part time NHS porter here. Whether you want me to or not, you have to sit the fuck down in the wheelchair, and I have to wheel you to radiology. I'm sorry, I don't like it, I'm aware that it's bloody demeaning, but it's the rules. Just sit back, relax and enjoy the ride. Hell, if you're friendly I might even be willing to sneak you a cup of tea while you're waiting. We learn from the bodies of our patients and we practice things on you, while you are dead or unconscious. We practice intubation on the dead, teach someone to place a catheter on you, while you are not conscious etc. Sorry but your body is the best way for us to learn, and we sincerely mean you no harm. Yes I did intubate your dead baby for the sake of practice, and I did place my first catheter on your child who was unconscious. I hope this doesn't bother you, slash I'm your pediatrician. When I ask you your pain level and you tell me some high number all, while sitting there comfortably with no strain or any signs and symptoms, that only lowers my trust in what you tell me, and does not make it more likely for me to prescribe pain medications. Not to say all those people who have high pain are lying, of course not, but when someone says oh I don't know, about 12 scale 1 to 10, while sipping on a coffee, relaxing in an exam chair, it's hard to take them seriously. I'm not a doctor, but always get a second opinion and be persistent. My dad recently had three of his fingers go numb and turn purple. He made an appointment to meet with a vascular surgeon, and as soon as she saw them, just examined the fingertips, no other tests or anything, said they'll have to come off. I'm assuming since she was a surgeon she had a certain bias towards surgical solutions, but she made up her mind right then and there. She made an appointment for him with internal medicine two weeks down the road, because she classified it as non-urgent, even though it wasn't believed to be life-threatening, my dad's current livelihood depended on him having his fingers. My mom then went to our family doctor, to protest the two weeks, and he agreed and called in a few favors, to have it changed to the next day. When he saw the internal medicines guy he had a completely different view on how to solve it, and put my dad on preventative medications based on what he thought it could be until the results were in. No more than 3 days later, and the color returned, a few weeks later feeling even came back. They still don't know exactly what caused it, but at least he still has his fingers. That there is so much cluster fucking going on between doctors, and your doctors don't talk, unless you're in the hospital. You sending your prescription into the doctor, who doesn't prescribe it means it's probably not going to happen. At 9am. I'm a great physician, and will hold your hand, 
and listen to all your problems with a genuine smile on my face. At 4.45pm, I can't care less about you and all I want to do is go home and smoke a bowl. Veterinarian here, so that's a customer, rather than a patient complaint. I don't want you to know that for everything I tell you, there will be dozens of lunkheads on the internet telling you the exact opposite. Unfortunately, that's pretty pointless, but there is just so little regulation of animal health claims that it can get effing annoying.